pleasure it is to be here with fellow Pritchard committee members and invited guests, and I am honored to be able to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Jonathan Pluck. Jonathan is at Johns Hopkins University. He is at the Center for Talented Youth, as well as within the College of Education there. He is the inaugural Stang... St Sorry. Um, Julian Stanley, professor at, at Johns Hopkins. And Julian Stanley was certainly one of the leaders in Gifted Ed. And it makes me proud that Jonathan is the one to hold that title for the very first time. Jonathan and his colleagues, and primarily Jonathan, coined the term excellence gap. Excellence is what we of the Pritchard Committee are all about. And it is my honor to introduce Jonathan to share with us what is the excellence gap and what difference does this make for us as we consider best practices for Kentuckians. Jonathan. Nobody actually responds. That was great. <laughs> I was at home and said that it would be total silence. So uh, I, I thank you. Uh, it is a uh, true honor to be here. Um, I, I don't, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, but uh, the Commonwealth has been at the forefront of education reform for over a quarter century. Um, and I know you won't take credit for it, but the Richard Committee has a lot to do with that. Um, a lot of people around the country absolutely. A lot of people around the country do look to you to see where you're pushing, where those next cutting edge ideas are uh, going to come from. So you've had great success, but I don't think anyone would argue with me that there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Uh, one particular area, excellence gaps, that I want to put on your radar screen if they aren't all ready. Um, I should say, uh, I was a faculty member at um, the university to the north for a long time, and uh, the Indiana Education Roundtable was something that they were very proud of. They won't admit it, but it was kind of based on you. Never said that. I don't know where you heard that rumor. Um, uh, and the demise of their Education Roundtable uh, really kind of marked the stalling of their education reform. Um, uh, so they learned the right lesson from you that they should have one. Uh, but they didn't do it as well as you have done it now for a long time. So congratulations on that. Um, uh, I've got three hours of great material for you tonight. <laughs> I think I'm joking today. Uh, but I only have 30 minutes, so we're going to move really quickly. Um, okay. Johns Hopkins. Uh, they really like when I talk about them for 15 minutes, about how great they are at the very beginning. Let's all agree that I did that. And we're going to move on. Um, uh, they are awesome, um, and uh, I couldn't be here. I think it gives me tremendous flexibility to go and work with people um, around the, the entire globe, actually. So I'm very, very grateful. Uh, CTY does amazing things for students. Um, my own daughter uh, participates in, in some of their online programs. So, one of the, the things that you do is study. So let's start out with some background. What are the world's 10 largest countries by population? Little hint? Okay, those are the easy ones. Indonesia. Indonesia's the top 10 countries, not number three though. Russia's definitely one of them still. 
pretty sure someone said the name of something that's not really a country, so... <laughs> trying hard, though, so I think we get other points. Uh, the, third, the third country uh, is by far the third biggest country in the entire world. It's considered a mega country, uh, but people within it think of itself as a small little western outpost that just happens to have 320 million people. We are much bigger than everyone else on this top 10 list. We don't think of ourselves as a huge country, though. So when we talk about things like, why is it so hard to change things? There's 320 million reasons why it's hard to change, right? We're a huge, huge country, both geographically and population-wise. Here are the others very quickly. Think about how small Bangladesh is. It's like a postage stamp on the globe. And it has about 130, 140 million people in that small space. Uh, which of these countries is growing the fastest? Russia, Japan are the only two that are shrinking. Uh, the, this country will be the number three country by 2050, according to our friends at the CIA. In fact, they made no stuff, so I assume they're right. It's Nigeria. So when people say, why would I care about a Muslim uh, civil war in the oil fields of Central Africa? Uh, who cares about that? My response is, all of us. There's going to be 350 to 400 million Nigerians within the next three decades in the heart of one of the fastest growing continents in the world. A stable Nigeria is really important for all of us. An unstable Nigeria will impact everyone's life. These things matter. These things matter. Okay, let's do another one real quickly. How many people worked as smartphone designers in 2007? Nine years ago. <laughs> it's funny because it could have been true for the most part. Um, uh, my, uh, my broader point here, I will cut to the chase, is that uh, you could not have prepared one of your students, right, or, or one of your kids or whoever, to work in this industry that now, broadly defined, probably employs 50 million, 100 million people around the globe? Not at Samsung. <laughs> Not at Samsung anymore. Read <laughs> uh, the jokes for whoever I'm just kidding. Um, uh, you could not have prepared someone to work in this industry in 2006, because nobody knew that it was going to exist. So I always kind of chuckle when I hear people say, we need to prepare these kindergartners for the working world of tomorrow. And I think you literally, there's no way for you to predict what that world will look like, what those jobs will look like. So preparing for specific jobs becomes really tricky because we don't know what those jobs will be. We don't know what those jobs will be. What percentage of engineering majors work in engineering? Someone got it right away. That's good. Normally, I let you guess a little bit. We don't have time. Roughly 50 percent, 30 percent of the 50 who don't say they couldn't find a job. That's been pretty consistent for years, um, and yet we tell students all the time, especially if they're good in STEM fields, going into engineering is the key to a middle class, upper middle class, successful existence. Maybe in certain types of engineering, right? So even during the, uh, the depths of 2009's job market, there were 2.6 million open positions. And they were mostly STEM jobs, but they were a very thin slice. They were essentially information technology and networking jobs. Uh, I believe last month was the record for open jobs. Uh, the record before was 3.6 million. It's about 3.6 and a half million right now. The vast majority of those jobs, again, are STEM jobs, but a very specific type. So a lot of things that we've been telling students, yeah, go ahead and get a physics degree, go ahead and get this, go ahead and get that. Some of that has not been great advice in terms of actually helping them get employed. Uh, oh, I love this one. 1% 1 of 85-year-olds live in nursing homes, any sort of assisted living facilities. 30%, 20%, 60%? 70%. Someone says zero and someone says 100, well, I've covered absolutely everything. <laughs> awesome. 
20%. And you will be correct. It's 11%. That's sharply down from the peak, which was around 1 in 4 in 1990. Part of this is better health care, um, better infrastructure to help people live independently. Uh, three of my grandparents made it to or have made it to 85, uh, and assisted living has never even been part of the conversation. Uh, in large part due to American health care, to, to be very frank about it. Uh, and people are starting to do what you used to do before the 70s, which is move back in with family as opposed to assisted living. Uh, that was very common. That's how I knew all my great aunts and great, un and, and great uncles, is that they would move back in with my grandparents, and that's how I would meet them. Um, then, for about 25 to 30 years, Americans really moved in the opposite direction. That became very, very rare. Now, it's um, according to some stats I've seen, uh, it's more common than it's ever been before. So the way that we structure families has radically changed. So people are much more likely to be living with grandparents and other relatives than they ever have before. Conversely, paradoxically, they're also much more likely to live in a single or no parent family, a no parent home than they ever have before. Family structure in the past literally decade has radically changed. That changes how we find talented students. Uh, this is be my last one here. Uh, what percent of world GDP crosses borders? Economists call this global flow, and it's everything. Electrons, email, uh, people, goods, money. 36%. It peaked at 52%. So when people say the world is becoming global, um, we haven't come that close to it yet. Uh, and think about how the 52% changed everything. Uh, imagine if that number becomes 75%. Uh, job markets, quality of life, everything will change when that happens. Or what happens if we pull back and make it 20%? Uh, we're not really sure which direction this is going. Most of the decrease, believe it or not, is in the last couple of years. So it's not the downturn um, uh, more than it is just changing the way that we do things. Interestingly, only 15% of internet traffic crosses international borders. <coughs> so most of our social media, most of our information that we get is us talking to ourselves. And that may be fine, um, but it's a much lower percentage than most people realize. So my broader point here is uh, it's a crazy, bold, new world. The types of skills that are important for the jobs moving forward are predicted by the OECD, the Rich Nations Club, if you will, to change radically. Um, uh, those two on top are really about how to use, use and communicate information. Um, even manufacturing jobs. And Kentucky is a state, a commonwealth, excuse me, a commonwealth. Do you get insulted when people call you a state? Or is this just something that you only tell outsiders to make us nervous? Okay, it's fine, okay. Um, I think people pull on my leg whenever I say state. Uh, the Commonwealth um, is a leader in advanced manufacturing. And I've talked to a Fortune 500 um, plant manager here about three or four years ago, and I said, how has manufacturing changed? And he said, oh, we're actually hiring. And I was like, wow. He was like, yes, this is the big comeback story, advanced manufacturing. But then he paused and he said, you need to keep one thing in mind, though. And I said, what's that? And he said, I used to walk the plant floor and I supervised lots of people on the line. Now I walk the floor and I supervise the people who manage the robots. He said, they have a very different skill set than the people you know, with the welding torches and the rivet guns. It's a very different person who's working on why is this robot not doing things correctly? How do I fine tune this? It's a very different skill set. So manufacturing is a huge American comeback story, but it's a different type of manufacturing. It needs a different level of talent, and that's what we're really concerned about here. Uh, the short of this is, uh, in the last five years, the first time ever that more non-Americans got US patents than Americans. Uh, so even our own ideas are mostly coming from elsewhere now. Um, we give you a little background, and we'll go very quickly through these. Uh, in general, 
This is the percentage of students who score advanced on international tests. This is just math, science, and reading look roughly similar. I've helpfully pointed out for you where American students are. And contrary to popular belief, uh, these are not apples and oranges comparisons now. That was probably fair 20 years ago. Uh, these are very good, well-administered tests now. Uh, we do not produce the world's top students anymore. anymore. Uh, let's go state by state very, very quickly. This is the NAEP. This is the big national assessment. It's a very high quality assessment. I'm going to show you math grade 4, math grade 8, then reading language arts grade 4 and grade 8. Uh, this is the percent of students who score advanced. If you don't want to be red, um, green is better. So that's grade 4 math. That's grade 8 math. That's better, both for the U.S. and for the Commonwealth. This is grade 4 reading. Not bad. That's grade 8 reading. Oh, wow. you, might, you might not have noticed the difference between these two, so let me show those to you again. <laughs> grade 4 reading. Grade 8 reading. Grade 12 data is in awesome data. It's hard to motivate high school seniors to take a test in the spring before they graduate. Um, uh, but those data suggest that this pattern is even worse. Pretty much solid grade for 12th graders. Um, so we're not producing as many excellent students as we probably need to to keep our culture and our economy coming along. Um, we have more time. I would talk about this. We just did a study. We were uh, looking at the federal education law that was just reauthorized. And one of our concerns is that it talks a lot about grade level proficiency. It's all about getting students to grade level. And as I'll talk about, uh, I'm not sure getting students to grade level is really uh, the end zone for us, if you will. It's more like the 25 yard line. Um, and so I, I was complaining about this to a, a foundation head, and she asked a great question. She said, well, how many of our students are actually above grade level? And I said, okay, how many students, for example, started fourth grade this fall already documenting that they can work at a fifth grade level or higher? I assumed the percentages would be 10, 15%. Um, we looked at data from almost every single state. Uh, actually, every state was included in at least one of the six different databases that we used. We used different tests, um, I, different subject areas. The numbers all came out roughly the same. Uh, in English language arts, it's 20 to 45 percent of students start the school year already having demonstrated that they know everything that they're about to be taught. 20 to 45 percent. Uh, generally, the percentage gets higher as you move into middle school, which we didn't expect either. 10 percent uh, were at least four grade levels up. Um, so that was at least 10 percent of fourth graders working at an eighth grade level. At the eighth grade proficiency level. Math is a little bit lower. We think that's because it's harder for students to push themselves further math, uh, and it's harder for teachers to allow them to move further, because uh, it's kind of hard to teach a fourth or fifth grader calculus. There are ways to do it, but I think that's why that, why that number is lower. Uh, and then this caused us to go and look at different data. Uh, we have a few estimates now that the average elementary school classroom has 8 to 11 grade levels of student performance in it. Now imagine that you're a new teacher. Imagine that you're a new teacher, you've been trained really well, you've got tons of energy, and you get into that classroom and you suddenly realize you have to differentiate 8 to 11 grade levels, because you're not using ability grouping or anything like that. We already know that differentiation, right, is one of the hardest skills for teachers to do. Study after study after study has shown us this for over 20, 25 years now. It's extremely difficult. It takes years to master. It's especially hard when you're not ability grouping or cluster grouping or something like that. It's doable, but only our best teachers can really do it right out of the, uh, right out of the gates, if you will. Um, uh, 8 to 11. Some of the estimates that we've seen are 13, which, if you think about it, that's every grade level, um, which is, is shocking. So the 21st century, brave new world, a lot of things 
that used to work for this country in terms of finding and developing talent just don't make sense anymore. Uh, the world has changed, and a lot of these changes have literally happened in the last decade. It's not over the last hundred years, it's over the last five to ten years. We've seen tremendous cultural, social, intellectual, educational change. Schools and how we educate students, how we develop talent, has to change a lot. Um, and again, when people say, oh, bright kids will take care of themselves, we don't, we don't have to worry about them. I think these data pretty clearly show, uh, yeah, okay, and I, I hear, hear that all the time from people, and I always say, you know, you're totally right, except for all the kids that doesn't really work for them. Um, which I'm going to make the case is 60 to 75 percent. Let's talk about excellence gaps really quickly. Uh, I once made this graphic because one of my colleagues had a fancy graphic in his presentation. And I thought, I can do fancy graphics too. So I called my third grade over and said, look what your dad did. And he was totally silent. And so I, I said, well, see, I'm trying to say, he goes, oh, I understand it. It's just not good. Uh, uh, the important part here is that proficiency gaps, getting students to that, out of that novice into that proficiency category, those gaps do not correlate with excellence gaps. A rising tide does not lift all ships when it comes to promoting talent. We really believed that was true for a long time in the No Child Left Behind era. It turns out it's not. And we have a few studies now that pretty strongly suggest that, for example, in reading, the strategies that we use to get students up to grade level in reading are not the same cognitive strategies we use to help students of advanced users of language. So it, these are different types of solutions. It's not the same problem. So it can't, by definition, solve itself. And where is Kentucky on there with those of us who... Kentucky? I think I have a laser. I'm going to share fairly detailed data with you in one second. Um, so we've been working on excellence gaps for a long time. Uh, very quickly, so this is the percent of students from 1996 to 2013 um, who scored advanced on the NAEP grade four math test. Most other subject areas and grade levels would look the same. So for our purposes tonight, I'm just gonna stick with this. Uh, one, I don't think most people could have told you how few students scored advanced 20 years ago. That's amazingly low. Some groups have done better. So this top group is the group that does not qualify for federal lunch assistance. No free reduced lunch. This is the group on the bottom that does qualify. Meager, meager gains. This is a big problem because these students are over half of our student population now. Uh, about three years ago we crossed 50%. It actually increases about one and a quarter percent each year. It has not slowed down since 2000. If anything, it's ticked up a little bit. So we're getting more and more students who are econ economically vulnerable every single year. And unfortunately, very few of them are scoring at advanced levels. If you do it by race, it's pretty much the same story. Asian American, uh, white, black, Hispanic students. I'm sorry, Hispanic, black students. In, uh, people ask why we don't use other content areas. Uh, one, the feds don't test them nearly as much, so we don't have very good data. But the data are actually worse in areas like science, economy, history, civics. Uh, no advanced scorers in any, in any group. I don't know about you, but it scares me that we don't have advanced students in science. It seems pretty important to this country. Um, we can't import all of our talent. This is really what we're trying to do now. Uh, what about Kentucky? I know you're sitting here going, ugh, if it weren't for those other 49 states in D.C., was that we'd be crushing it, but um, not so much. Uh, I do have to say, uh, it defaults to blue or red, and I didn't want to get into any college rivalries. <laughs> so I'm sure some university in Kentucky has green. Uh, just assume I did it for you. I didn't want to get um, so these are all students. This is grade four math again. This is uh, the brand new data that just came out on 2015. Seven percent. That's a little low nationally. Um, there's no reason why that number couldn't be 15 percent in a state like Kentucky. 
Uh, I included gender because that's a bigger gender gap than we normally say. 9% versus 5%. In most states now, it's a couple percentage points at most. And then it's, if it were language, it would be flipped. A couple percentage points. You have a fairly typical language gender gap. You have a surprisingly large, I mean, that's, that's almost 100%. Uh, and then if you did it by race, you would see this too. Um, but this is by uh, lunch status. I actually have those flip flops. Sorry, that's uh, on lunch assistants, not on lunch assistants. That is very large, but it's fairly typical in the United States. <coughs> so uh, when people say these kids will take care of themselves, uh, no, they, they aren't. They aren't. And unfortunately, the ones who aren't, now do make up about 65 to 75% of our student population in most states. In some states, it's close to 100%. So we're getting smaller and smaller groups of students that we're getting all of our town from. A state like Massachusetts is a great example of this. Uh, Massachusetts has great test scores. And their excellence rates are essentially the best in the country, some of the best in the world. But their excellence gaps are the biggest so they've done it mostly with upper socioeconomic status white and Asian American students. I live close to Massachusetts. I grew up close to Massachusetts. They have like three of the ten poorest cities in the country in terms of childhood poverty. Uh, their success, I'm not saying it's smoke and mirrors. They've done some amazing things. But they are not helping, and they're not helping themselves, I think, by not getting talent developed. All these talented students who are not performing at advanced levels. Really big excellence gaps. That's going to haunt us. Um, so we can predict with a pretty high accuracy that a talented student, even if they're performing at advanced levels in second or third grade, uh, the research is very clear that almost none of them will be performing at that level by the time they get, if they graduate high school, by the time they get to the end of high school. We used to call it the permanent talent underclass, but we decided that was too uh, depressing. It's also accurate, though. Um, uh, we're not seeing a lot of these students moving into those advanced levels. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what, what we think we can do about this. Uh, so we'll go with persistent talent underclass. But here, uh, and Dr. Roberts and I, uh, were, uh, she, she was one of the first ones to work with me on this. We just, again, we need to take advantage of the fact that our country is gigantic, right? So even small improvements in closing that excellence gap are going to produce tens of thousands of talented students in student populations that where, where, where we haven't seen them before. That can really change things for people. So for example, if we close the low income excellence gap roughly by half, we're not going to be Pollyanna-esque and say, we're going to wipe out poverty, we're going to write we're going to wipe out discrimination. We're going to make sure everyone gets a perfect education and get this to zero. That's not terribly likely in the near future. What if we just decrease it by half? That's 80,000 more students. Back in the envelope calculation uh, for, for our new book I'm about to talk about is that that's about three quarters of a million students. That's actually a really important number uh, because there's uh, each year, we have about 725,000 international students who come to our colleges, universities, you know, et cetera. We really depend on those 725,000. Um, we have at least that many talented students right here. Right there. We're just not developing their talents. We could flood the economy and our culture, our communities, with people taking advantage of their talents. Think how that would change things for us. We believe that's a doable goal each year. So, how do we engage and eliminate these excellence gaps? Yeah. Do you see how I cleverly used the slogan? Yeah, yeah. Did, 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 did my homework. Um, so, we have a book. Uh, it's not really forthcoming anymore. It's not officially released until another couple weeks, but you will see we have copies here today. Um, what Scott and I did. Um, uh, Harvard uh, came to us and said, you know, could you write a book, um, uh, can you write a book that um, summarizes how we actually solve this problem? You've raised awareness around the country, and my initial response was, nope, we do not know enough yet. 
we decided, uh, we talked to people for two months. I did something that's making this fun. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is, that, is, that, is that is that my warning? <laughs> I still have five minutes. <laughs> nice <day. laughs> Um, let me use that next time I screw up something. Uh, uh, we talked to people for two months. We went into uh, New York City, we went into various schools, we talked to lots of people, um, and we actually contacted Harvard again and said, you know what, I was wrong. I think we actually do have a good sense of what we can start doing to close these gaps. And then they called our bluff and said, okay, can you write this in six months? I said, no, and they were like, great, we can't wait to see it. And that literally was how the conversation went. So we wrote it very quickly, um, but we're very happy with our model at the end. I don't have time, time to go through this. I'm just going to pick through a couple of pieces. Um, but we think that there is a lot of evidence that we have people in small pockets around the country who are finding ways to close these excellence gaps. No one has wiped it out. It's going to take a, a lot more than education. Um, we don't have time to talk about poverty reduction and uh, things like that. But we do think that there are things, many fairly low costs that can be done that actually can help us shrink these gaps. One that I would point out, um, they're all interesting, let me talk about opportunities. So I think educators the last five to ten years have gotten very wise to the fact that providing great opportunities for students doesn't mean anything if you can't get there. So if you can't afford them, you have to use public transportation to get it on a weekend. In, in most of this country, that is not going to happen. So we've gotten much better at that. But what we're finding in several studies now is that we look at opportunities. Most of us here who are fairly middle class, upper middle class lens as Americans, which is to say, if there's an opportunity, my kid deserves it. Darn it. I don't care what the opportunity is. They deserve it. Not all families have that attitude. So in inner city Baltimore, we've had these great programs that, we put, that, 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 me, that we've been putting in place. It, it, we would provide transportation, scholarships, we made sure the students were ready for them, and they still wouldn't show up. And so we've done interviews with the parents, and quite frankly, usually a single mother or the grandmother who's taking care of them. And what they tell us is, well, I'm just not sure he or she deserves it. Mm -hmm. You know what? A lot of other studies are starting. We just assume, because we would jump at it for our kids, that everyone understands that an opportunity is something that's great. If you're dealing with generational poverty, systematic discrimination, that's not often your mindset. And that's an ugly thing to have to talk about, because it's not fun, but that's something that we need to try to fix, is to help people understand that these are opportunities that their kids, that their grandkids are ready for. Something that simple, we think, makes a huge difference. Um, a lot of those other things are fairly obvious. Uh, so I'm going to close with uh, just a couple more slides here. Um, learn from the mistakes of Chinese marathon runners. So uh, China, how many of you have been to China? Oh, many of you. Uh, this will make total sense to you. Uh, the Chinese government, about six, seven years ago, decided to do a secret study about what makes a nation a great nation. And one of their top conclusions was, great nations hold marathons. <laughs> if you spend any time in China, you're going, yeah, I can see them concluding that. That's kind of how their bureaucracy works. Um, so the edict went out immediately to all the regional governments. Start holding marathons and make people run in them now. Now this, if you need a clear indicator of a difference between the United States and China, if you were a marathon runner in this country and the government told you to run a marathon, most Americans would say, I'm never running again. In China, they were like, okay, tomorrow. But you know what happens when you go to run a marathon? And uh, this is also another great thing. Uh, an American who's never trained for a marathon would get a half a mile into it and be like, all right, I did it, I'm done. Where's the local pub? I'm out of here. Uh, the Chinese stuck with it until the end. You know what the problem is? In some of these marathons, over half of the people end up hospitalized. <laughs> this is a key part. This is a key, key part. I didn't make it up. Um, 
<laughs> front loading matters. <laughs> Bear with me for a minute here. Um, <laughs> when we create programs like AP incentive programs, where we get students who wouldn't normally take advanced placement classes to take advanced placement classes, if we haven't front loaded, if we haven't helped them prepare for that more rigorous coursework, what's going to happen? They're going to struggle. They're going to take the AP test, which is really the reason to take the AP course. How, how are they going to do? Very, very poorly. And you know what? That's exactly what's happened. We did front load. We did not make sure that they were ready. So when we create this high school intervention, part of that intervention should have been bringing the middle school teachers in. To say, OK, these students in three years need to be able to take AP US history. What can we do now to make sure that we're making up for what they didn't get earlier? And then you go to the late elementary teachers and say, OK, middle school is going to get a bit more rigorous. You need to help front load the students for that. On and on we go. Um, I will uh, beat this metaphor to death a little bit longer and say that when we focus on grade level proficiency, that is essentially like saying, if you get to the third mile in the marathon, declare victory. And I would argue that that's not really fair. If we have a talented poor student, for example, in Kentucky or anywhere, getting them to the third mile when they have the potential to go all 26.2 is not victory. It is literally a mile marker on a much longer journey. Most of our education policy in most states in this country, almost all of them, um, is about getting the student to the third mile marker. Uh, I encourage you, as you work on your projects, as you work with teachers and parents, think about how we can better prepare these students to get to that end of that marathon, as opposed to focusing on the third mile. Um, some Kentucky wisdom. We've been working with Kentucky educators the past 36 hours or so. Uh, there were two great comments this morning, one from a, a superintendent. What's best for the child should drive policy, but we let policy drive what's best for the child. I sat there in the back of the room and was like, oh my gosh, we do do that, don't we, sometimes? When I'm in schools, I hear people tell me all the time, well, yeah, he or she probably, probably could use some extra help, or maybe we should accelerate them a bit, but we have this policy. Who cares? One kid, come on! Uh, we need to change that mindset. The second one I loved was we need to shift our goal from novice reduction to proficiency reduction. I like that one a lot too, and that was by a principal. Um, I sat there and I thought, yeah, the goal here, again, isn't to get as many proficient students as we can. If 100% of our students are proficient, that's great. I think we have an ethical and moral responsibility to get them there. If that's where we stop, we are not harnessing all the great talents that this country provides to us. We need to do that. On that note, if I've done this correctly, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. and I know there will be some, you have uh, yellow pieces of paper on your table. And we are fortunate to have a few copies of Dr. Plucker's book, Excellence Gaps in Education, um, that we would like to courtesy of Dr. Plucker and Dr. Julia Roberts. And if, you, if you're interested in a copy of the book, please put your name on a yellow sheet of paper um, that you'll find on your table and jot down how you might advocate for excellence in your community and put this yellow piece of paper in a container that we have right outside the doors when you leave. And tomorrow we will draw from that container and give away the books that we have. Um, if you're not here tomorrow and we draw your name, we will find you and we will either hand deliver or mail your book. Um, so please give some thought to that as you're thinking about uh, questions this evening and beginning to head out. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions for Dr. Plucker on, on what you've heard tonight. I think all of you know that we released a report earlier this year, Excellence with Equity, It's Everybody's Business. 
um, and it, it's clear um, that we're striving for excellence for our students. And Dr. Plucker's book and his research provides us, I think, more food for thought as to how we achieve that. Um, and so with that, questions, and I see one, David. Um, I'm chair of the board in Jefferson County, which is Louisville, so our largest um, district, and we've got um, a lot of choice, we've got magnets, we've got one magnet in particular that um, has a sort of a STEM track, um, but it doesn't really teach anything different from any other. It aggregates the highest performing students. Are there examples of magnet programs that are using dual credit, um, effectively um, teaching to a college or a graduate school curricular level um, to really raise the bar for the, um, the kids who are ready to go a whole lot further, as you described? Um, sounds good. Uh, there aren't a ton of examples. Uh, we've done some research on magnets and charters and I know this sounds self-evident, but the structure doesn't matter so much as what happens within them. So when you said they're not really doing anything differently, they're just aggregating the best students, and shockingly, they're doing really well. Right? That's, that's me. Right? And, um, yeah. and, uh, um, and then we usually evaluate those schools by saying, look, where are these kids? Oh, it's just amazing. Right. And, uh, as they should, if you're aggregating students who are already doing well, right? So we, um, uh, we find this with charters. Uh, we looked at all of, say, Georgia's charter schools. No difference whatsoever whether you were attending the charter or not. Excellence doesn't change. Excellence gaps don't change. Then we looked at the schools, and they're all kind of doing the same thing. I, so there's no, there's, we, we've gotten good at the differentiation in form giving parents choices. Uh, most Americans think, in general, that's not a bad idea. Uh, we have not differentiated function. And that's what we need to do in some of these schools. That's when we're going to start to see things. That's a lot harder to do, obviously. Um, uh, I, uh, I was in a very large urban school district. I won't name them. Let's call them Posvangelists. <laughs> And uh, they were complaining about their charters. Like, no, they say, we're, we're, I mean, some of our charters don't, don't even have waiting lists. And they gave me a great example. There's a street corner in South Central LA where there's three charter schools. It's like a Starbucks. One on that corner, one on that corner, one on that corner. And I asked what I thought was a really simple question, which was, OK, how, how is their mission different? And just, I've never seen such blank looks in my life. And they were like, well, no, they all do the same thing. And I was like, ah, you have not, you have not thought this chase me through very carefully, have you? Um, uh, we need to be doing different things if we want different results. And I know that sounds so incredibly obvious. Policy has not caught up with that yet. And we need to be thinking more about that. Right here. I'm just curious what your thoughts of um, at what age children should be tested and decide what their track will be, if it's an AP curriculum, or um, should a classroom be contained and different children are broken out and given different curriculum? What's your thoughts on that? Um, it's a nice, simple question. <laughs> <laughs> There's like 16 questions embedded in that. Really good. At least. Um, at, at least 16 <laughs> questions. Um, so I'm going to exercise my prerogative uh, to answer the one that I want to answer. Sure. How's that? Sure. Um, uh, I think, well, the research is very clear in the last few years. If you're going to be testing to identify talent, you have to, you have to test every child. You can't have a, 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 a teacher nomination be the first screening point. Because if you do that, I will tell you exactly what the the student body being tested will look like, let alone what the results will be. Uh, the National Research Center in uh, Connecticut uh, showed this earlier this year, a really interesting study. Uh, very talented, underrepresented minority and poor students um, who, who did score well, didn't get screened 
in the first screening because their teachers didn't nominate them. We've seen study after study after study just in the last year and a half. Teacher nominations are really tricky. A lot of people use teacher nominations first. Now, as a former elementary and high school teacher, I see the value of teacher nominations. Because sometimes I was the only teacher who pointed at the poor black student and said, why haven't you thought about him or her? So I, I, I see the value in it. That just shouldn't be the first screen. That should be the, who did we miss with the testing screen? Um, so I think that's critically important. You have to test everybody. Um, I don't think you can test at one point and make those decisions. I think you need to do it periodically. Uh, New York City has decided they're going to test at kindergarten, and uh, they're going to use national norms. And I just think they sh they're shocked. They're shocked that their student population in those gifted programs is Asian American, white, upper income. That's exactly how they designed the program. I, I could have predicted almost to the decimal point what those percentages would, would have been. Some of this really is just stepping back in common sense, too. So I didn't answer a lot of your question, no, that, but um, thank you. Right here. Dr. Plug, this is really difficult because I'm going to reflect my lack of insight for a whole lifetime. And I come from an area where generational poverty is dominant. What on earth is the trick to flip the attitude between what my child deserves and what